Hello, welcome to the Global Alliance for Tibet and Persecuted Minorities. My name is Tsering Pasang and I'm the convener at the Global Alliance for Tibet and Persecuted Minorities. We are a human rights and advocacy group campaigning for the rights of the peoples of Tibet, East Turkestan, as well as for all those minorities who are facing persecutions, especially in China. Today, 17th of May marks the 26th anniversary of the enforced disappearance of Kendin Chuki Nima, the 11th pension Rinpoche, recognized by His Holiness the Dal Dalai Lama as the reincarnation of the previous 10th pension Lama. Kendin Chuki Nima was born on 25th April 1989, three days after his recognition as the 11th pension Lama. On 17th May 1995, the six-year-old Kentin Chuki Nima disappeared with his parents and Chade Rinpoche, who was the head of the Tashilumbo Monastery in Shigatse, Tibet. Chade Rinpoche was secret in, secretly in contact with the Dalai Lama in India regarding the 11th Penchen Lama's search, who was also entrusted to head the Penchen Lama search uh, committee by the Chinese uh, government. Six months later, China announced its own 11th Pension Lama, Kensian Nubu, as the reincarnation of the previous 10th Pension Lama in November 1995. For Tibetan Buddhists, the Dalai Lama's recognized, recognized 11th Pension Lama, that is Kentin Chiki Nima, is the true reincarnation of Tibet's second highest spiritual leader. Venerable Arja Rinpoche, one of the senior most Tibetan Buddhists in Tibet, who defected to the US in 1998, was entrusted by the Chinese government. He wrote in his book, Surviving the Dragon, a Tibetan Lama's account of 40 years under Chinese rule. I quote, as for the people of Tibet, no matter how politics changed, for them, the Dalai Lama and the Penchen Lama remained the sun and the moon. To this day, they believe that the reincarnations of both must be mutually recognized to be valid. Quote close. Arja Rinpoche was um uh, as uh, was uh, a member of the 11th Penchen Lama Search Committee and he was abbot of the Kumbu Monastery in Amdo, Northeast Tibet. In his book again, he wrote, I quote, Tibetans clearly wanted the 14th Dalai Lama to be the final arbiter of the identity of the true reincarnation of the Penchen Lama. This is Arjun Rinpoche's book. Despite repeated requests for access, the whereabouts of the Dalai Lama's recognized Penchen Lama is not still known to anyone to this day, except to the Chinese authorities. At the time of his enforced disappearance in 1995, Kentin Chukinima became the world's youngest political prisoner. So, to coincide with the 26th anniversary of the enforced disappearance of Kentin Chukinima, the 11th Pension Lama, recognized by the Dalai Lama, the Global Alliance for Tibet and Persecuted Minorities are organizing this special webinar on China, freedom of religious belief. We have amazing panel of experts to speak on this very important subject. And I wish to thank them all for accepting our humble invitation. We have Jim Shannon, a Democratic Unionist MP for Frankfurt, Northern Ireland, and she, she, who is also a shadow DUP spokesperson for health and human rights. Jim is also the chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for International 
freedom of relig religion or belief. We then have Dr. Tenzin Dorje, Associate Professor at California State University, Fullerton, USA. He was former chair of the US Commission on International Religious Freedom and is a highly uh, respected Tibetan scholar. Then we have um, Mr. Benedict Rogers, who is a frequent guest here. He is a journalist, chief executive officer of Hong Kong Watch, which he co-founded. Uh, also, he co-founded and uh, currently vice chairman of the Conservative Party Human Rights Commission. Is, and he was former um, East Asia team leader for Christian Solidarity Worldwide, uh, an amazing uh, advocate uh, of human rights. Then finally, we have um, amazing Kate Saunders, who is going to moderate today's webinar. She is author, writer, and Tibet specialist. Kate was former research director at the International Campaign for Tibet. She also served as the commissioning, uh, communications director for the International Campaign for Tibet. Kate also worked for now defunct, uh, its Tibet Information Network, London-based Tibet News Research Agency, which was very rep a very reputable agency before it was closed down. Now, without taking much time, I will hand over to Kate. Hello, Sarang. Can you hear me? Over to you, Kate, now. We've got a little bit technical glitch there. Please continue. Okay, thank you, Saringla, and thank you very much for inviting me on this uh, on this panel, um, which is um, a very good opportunity to speak on this particular day. You've explained already the significance 
of the anniversary. And I'd just like to say a few more words about uh, this, this day in relation to the Panchen Lama before coming to our um, esteemed panelists. So you mentioned uh, Arja Rinpoche, the former abbot of Kumbham Monastery, who was also close to the 10th Panchen Lama, who was a, a towering figure uh, responsible for possibly the most um, comprehensive critique of Communist Party policies um, in, the, in the 1960s. And I just wanted, to, in order to understand the significance of today's anniversary of the, of the abduction and disappearance of this five-year-old child who was recognized by the Dalai Lama, Gendon Choki Nima, on, on this day, those years ago, um, I just wanted to remember a story that Arja Rinpoche um, told in his book about what happened when the Dalai Lama recognized this five-year-old boy as the authentic 11th Panchen Lama. It set in train a cascade of events and immediately that the recognition was known, Arja Rinpoche was summoned to Beijing, where he spoke to Chinese officials and appealed to them to please take seriously the recognition of the Dalai Lama of this young boy, because it would be harmful for the credibility of all religious leaders in Tibet if the Chinese Communist Party did not. And he mentioned that the, the kindly face of this Chinese official that he was speaking to immediately became cold and impassive. And he told Arja Rinpoche, you must not speak of this for your own safety. Uh, and soon after that, he was summoned together with other religious lamas to a ceremony. Oh, we lost Kate there. Okay, I've been asked because of the technical difficulties um, if we can switch on to Jim uh, immediately. Um, also because I think Jim cannot be with us um, for too much longer, but um, we'd very much like to hear from you, Jim, uh, as part of the discussion. So if you wouldn't mind joining us right now, thank you very much. Can you hear me now, Kate? Yes, can I can. Thank you. Okay, look, sorry, sorry for all that difficulty. I'm not quite sure what's going on. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to understand it. But first of all, can I thank you very much uh, for the invitation to come along and uh, and be involved with your your webinar and and uh, seminar today. Yeah. Very pleased uh, as the chair of the oh, APPPG on freedom of religious belief to to speak up as I do for those of Christian faith, those of other faith, and indeed those with no faith across the, the, the whole of the world. Um, I, I'm particularly moved uh, uh, by the introductory comment uh, which referred to the, the, the uh, disappearance uh, of, of um, uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce, pronounce the name of the 11th Panchen Lama, uh, recognized by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama on the 15th of May 1995. It grieves me greatly to know that in all that period of time we've never been able to find out exactly what has happened or where they are so it's very very worrying as well 
Uh, what do we do in, in the debate that I had back, or uh, I, I was um, participated in back on the 22nd of April uh, as my party's uh, shadow spokesperson for human rights? I uh, made some comment about the Chinese Communist Party and their attitude to, to those of different religion, different ethnic uh, um, groups and those in China. And I referred to, in particular, to the Uyghur Muslims, to the 70 million Christians, to the 10 million Falun Gong, and to the 8 million Tibetan Buddhists, who are also very severely restricted with widespread, widespread state surveillance, harassment, and detention of religious leaders. Chinese government have been, over the last few years, indeed over a long period of time, have created a stifling and intimidating environment for, for uh, Tibetan so Buddhists who wish to practice their religion uh, with, with surveillance, uh, travel restrictions, and re-education programs. So quite clearly, the Chinese Communist Party have taken a, a, a direct action against Tibetan to, uh, Buddhists, and I want to speak up for them today. What can we do? Well, I, I believe there's a number of things we can do. I, I suggested the government. I'm not so sure if government have been very, very keen to do that. But I know that um, we, the, uh, my government, the UK government, will, will host the G7 summit. Uh, and I, I believe it's an absolutely incredible opportunity to defend our values on a global stage and use the G7 uh, summit for that purpose. So at, at that time, I call upon, and I do again, the minister and the government to lead their foreign counterparts at the G7 not only demanding foreign access to Xinjiang, well, but also to here, for the Christians, for the Falun Gong, and for the Tibetans as well, saying, but unequivocally condemning all human rights there. abuses in China. And I believe that the Communist Chinese Party, and that a substantial eco economic might, can no longer buy silence uh, from the West and our values are not for sale. I would also suggest that perhaps the, the 2022 Winter Olympics be moved from China. When it comes to action, let's take the action that hurts China and, and makes them focus their attention upon the things that are happening across the world that we're very unhappy with. Allowing the genocide, and I call them the genocide games, to go ahead as, as planned as tantamount to the international community condoling the CCP's actions. So if the, if the Chinese government plan to welcome thousands of people to China for the Olympics, perhaps they can first welcome UN human rights observers to look at all the things that are happening across China. Uh, and uh, when it comes to, to uh, the disregard that China has for media freedoms, we, we're very unaware in, in, in the, in the uh, across the world just exactly what, what is happening in Tibet. And, and, and the information doesn't come through with maybe the regularity yeah. that we'd like to see. So again, I would suggest that the, it's time that we uh, ensured that our standards of, of press right, freedom yes. are not compromised to spare yes. Chinese or, or China's yeah. blushes. So uh, uh, those are probably three things I think we can do, three things that we must do. Uh, and, and I believe yeah. that we have a, a duty, I believe a duty, uh, as a elected representative um, yeah. at parliament, but across the whole of parliament we have some i guess 135 Board. members or yeah. um, members of parliament and and members of so peers of the house as well out, and we're very clear that we we will speak yeah. up for those that have no voice so today i want to add my voice as the chair yeah. of the appg for freedom of religious belief and say to tibetans that's, that's on right. the anniversary of of, of of your calendar of events that have themselves. taken place really that we will continue yeah, yeah. to raise yeah, the yeah. issue of Tibetans uh, you know, and Buddhists in Tibet you know, and elsewhere. And I believe it's important that you know that your battle you is one that you're not fighting by yourself, but you're fighting it with the strength, that, with the commitment, the with the energy, with the courage, you know, and with the, yeah. the bravery that you show every day in Thanks Tibet. So and we can so do that much. on behalf okay. of, you of yourselves as well. So again, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm sorry that that that, that um, okay, I have okay, to go because I've got questions in the, in the chamber. I'm doing virtually here. I just want to uh, let you know that I think there's things that we can do. Those three things, the G7 summit, the, the uh, uh, 2022 Winter Olympics, uh, and, and uh, the, the media freedoms. If we can have those three things, then perhaps we can change China's attitude to religion and ethnic groups in China. And be that the Tibetans, in, in uh, the Buddhists in, in Tibet, or be the Christians in China, or be the Uyghur Muslims, or be it the Falun Gong. We're your voice at Westminster and we'll continue to do so. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jim. And we really appreciate your solidarity and uh, and your big heart and support of the the Tibetan people on so many issues. Because we've seen we've seen recently, given the scale and mag magnitude of uh, what is unfolding in China and across Tibet and in the Uyghur areas too. Uh, a new solidarity, I think, between Hong Kong people, between Tibetans, between Uyghurs, between Falun Gong, between Christians in China. And these sort of alliances are very important for us going forward. And I, you have always been active across the board on China rights issues. And also, not to forget the uh, the issue of the forced organ harvesting and you've been a, a, a very solid supporter of initiatives against that for, for many years. So thank you very much again, Jim. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Tenzin Dorji if, uh, if he will speak next on the panel. Dr. Dorji La, are, they, are you there? Unmute, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kate. And hello, all. And uh, thank you to the Global Alliance for Tibet and persecuted minorities to invite me on this webinar to talk about uh, freedom of religion in China and to mark uh, the 26th anniversary of abduction and forceful disappearance of uh, the 11th Benjamin Lama Gindin Shuiji Nima. Um, I had uh, the privilege and pleasure uh, to serve four years on the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, USERV, uh, uh, due to the kindness of uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who nominated me twice to the commission and the United States House of Representatives for appointing me on the commission. So you can only serve two terms there. And uh, I also had uh, the honor and privilege to serve as a chair uh, of the commission. And uh, so the United States uh, you know, Commission on International Religious Freedom has every year uh, you know, designated uh, China as a country of particular concern, meaning the worst ratings in terms of religious freedom. And uh, in our uh, you know, current report also, you can see that uh, all the religious believers in, uh, in uh, all over uh, China, Uyghurs, uh, Tibetan Buddhists, Falun Gong Christians are you know, persecuted uh, and, uh, you know, oppressed. And um, so today we mark uh, the um, forceful disappearance of uh, Pencha Lama Gindin Shuji Nima. And uh, at USERF, we also had uh, what we call Prisoners of Conscience Project. And I adopted among, uh, you know, hundreds of uh, prisoners of conscience in Tibet, uh, you know, His Holiness uh, Pencha Gindin Shuji Nima as my prison of conscience. And uh, so I also have, was invited to, to Tom Lando's Human Rights uh, Congressional Commission, uh, you know, to talk about uh, religious freedom issue in China and Tibet. And at that time, also talked about uh, the situation of uh, Benjamin Kindit Shiji Nima and uh, co-chair of uh, the commission, uh, Representative McGovern. You know, he was uh, persuaded by my uh, presentation and he kindly adopted uh, Benjamin Kindit Shiji Nima as a his prison of conscience. And when I uh, finished my term on the USF, uh, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, Commissioner Nina Menza has, uh, Nadine Menza has adopted uh, Pencil Lama as prison of conscience. So I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Pencil Lama a little later, uh, but first what I wanna say is that, uh, you know, uh, in Tibet uh, that I focus today, uh, that China has, uh, you know, uh, completely suppressed uh, the religious freedom and uh, they expelled thousands of monastics from Larungar, destroyed a major part of the Larungar and the same thing happening at Yarchenkar. Uh, and they used the state of the art technology uh, to monitor, uh, you know, everything uh, 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 to suppress the religious freedom for Tibetans and other religious uh, uh, believers. And so the United States Commission International Religious Freedom you know, we uh, unanimously uh, supported uh, uh, reciprocal access to Tibet uh, when I was a chair. And then later as a commissioner, uh, you know, also the use of unanimously supported uh, Tibet, uh, uh, you know, policy and support act. So in this, uh, uh, you know, uh, act, uh, you know, uh, one of the most important things is about, uh, uh, you know, the reincarnation of uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama future. 
And uh, so as we talk about uh, you know, Benjamin Lama, Gindit, Shuji, Nima, uh, who has been distributed uh, you know, uh, since uh, you know, 1995, uh, and we still don't know. I have asked on many occasions that at least China should have a decency uh, to provide a videographic uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, information of uh, the Pension Lama and his family and Chateau Rinpoche. So at least we know uh, that they are still alive. Uh, but China has even failed to do that much basic things. And so what I want you to know is that the Pension Lama's issue really represents a larger picture here uh, because uh, you know, China has used this, uh, you know, for their political uh, control and domination because they thought uh, that by installing Tian Sen Nubu, uh, you know, as their Pension Lama, so when His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, you know, who is in advanced age, uh, you know, later, if he's no more with us, uh, then they thought uh, they could use uh, their Pension Lama to recognize uh, the next reincarnation of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, but uh, the United States of America, uh, and uh, the use uh, in the Tibet uh, Subordinate Policy Act has made it very clear uh, that uh, China has no business at all, uh, you know, to um, meddle into uh, the Tibetan Buddhist practices and recognizing the reincarnations of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and all other Tibetan uh, uh, Buddhist uh, masters. So that's a very important issue. And throughout my four-year term, now even not as a commissioner, uh, you know, because we can never finish talking about uh, China's operation of religious freedom in all over China and Tibet. Uh, but there are two things China is always uh, uh, used uh, to suppress religion. Uh, one is called securitization. In the name of security, they tremble upon the basic religious and human rights freedom in all over China and Tibet. And they sinocide in the religions. And uh, so Tibetan Buddhist has been sinocized. And so then the Chinese Communist Party tell the monks uh, uh, that they should give priority uh, to national uh, you know, pride and identity rather than to, uh, you know, seeking enlightenment and all of that. Uh, and uh, so I know that I have very limited time uh, to do the presentations. Uh, uh, and uh, so what I want to uh, you know, uh, say uh, is uh, you know, uh, this, uh, that the uh, you know, United States government has stood very strongly uh, with uh, Tibet and Tibetan people, bipartisan. I mean, that's one issue uh, I think United States can all of be very proud about, that on both aisles, uh, they have stood uh, very firmly uh, to support His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, Tibet and Tibetan religious freedom, uh, and the preservation of Tibetan identity, language, culture, uh, et cetera. So I will yield back to you and later might have an uh, opportunity to respond to questions. Hello. Are you there? Kate? Can you hear me? Kate? Oh, sitting loud. Hello. Can't hear. Sorry about that. We have a little bit of technical glitch. Kate is uh, coming back now. Okay. So did you hear all my presentation or? Yes. Yes. yes okay. We did. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll... Thank you, Dr. Dojila. Thank you. Thank you, Tenzin Dojila, for that presentation. And there will be questions. I certainly have some questions for later. First of all, I'd uh, I'd just like to ask our final panelist, Dr. Uh, ben Ben Rogers, to speak. And um, I will hand over to you. And I think that Ben is going to give us something of an overview of the the Uyghur situation and other issues of um, religious belief and perhaps an update on what's happening here in the UK about uh, these issues. Thanks, Ben. Over to you. Okay, can, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kate. And it's a, a really great uh, privilege, although, of course, a, a, a sad uh, privilege and one I'm sure we would all prefer not to uh, be having to do, uh, and that is to mark the 26th uh, anniversary of the enforced disappearance of the Panchen Lama. And uh, I really express my solidarity to uh, the Tibetan people in particular uh, on this, this day. Um, but it is a privilege to speak alongside uh, uh, the other speakers. Um, I want to start by uh, saying that uh, I believe that China as a whole, whether we look at uh, Tibet, uh, the situation for the Uyghurs, the situation in Hong Kong, uh, the situation for Christians and Falun Gong and across the board, uh, is facing the worst human rights crisis uh, since the Tiananmen massacre of 1989, but also the most serious assault on freedom of religion or belief, really since the Cultural Revolution. I don't think there has been a time uh, since the Cultural Revolution where religion across the board has been under such uh, intense uh, repression uh, in China. We know that uh, the situation in Tibet uh, has uh, intensified. And I think um, I, I'm always very pleased to join uh, events that highlight Tibet and that or that are organized by the Tibetan community, because I think um, there can be a danger that as the uh, Uyghurs and Hong Kong in particular receive more attention, and rightly so, uh, because those two situations are uh, very grave, but there can be a danger that uh, the people inadvertently uh, forget about the situation in Tibet, because, of course, it has been going on uh, longer than any of the other situations that uh, we are concerned about. And it's really important that we don't forget Tibet and that we remember uh, the situation there and draw the world's attention to it. So I'm very glad uh, to uh, be able to do that. But um, I'm going to turn my attention now in my remarks to some of the other issues. And I'll start with the situation of the Uyghurs, which... Um, is increasingly being recognized for what it is, which is uh, the 21st century's uh, most recent genocide. The British, Canadian, and Dutch uh, parliaments have now recognized it as a genocide. Uh, both the outgoing uh, US administration and the incoming Biden uh, administration in the US have recognized it uh, as a genocide, uh, and a growing number of legal experts uh, and scholars <laughs> have done so uh, as well. And this genocide of the Uyghurs has a very strong uh, religious dimension to it. Uh, of course, it's not only religious, and there are uh, other atrocities affecting the Uyghurs that uh, don't relate to, to religious freedom. But uh, the religious dimension is clear. It has included the destruction of mosques or the closure of mosques. Uh, Uyghurs, who, Uyghur men who have uh, a beard of a certain length and Uyghur, Uyghur women who wear uh, a hijab uh, have uh, been uh, put into concentration camps simply for those acts. Uh, during the uh, fasting month of Ramadan, uh, there is evidence that uh, Uyghur Muslims have been prohibited from fasting uh, or uh, forced to eat uh, pork against their religious convictions or to drink uh, alcohol. Uh, and uh, Uyghurs who engage in uh, normal religious acts uh, of prayer or of reading uh, the Holy Quran uh, have ended up uh, in the uh, prison camps. Indeed, a significant portion of the between one to three million uh, Uyghurs in the concentration camps uh, in Xinjiang or East Turkestan are there because of their religious practices. Um, so the Uyghur situation really needs uh, our attention. Um, Falun Gong has been mentioned already in the, the discussions, uh, but uh, the persecution of Falun Gong continues. Uh, and of course, the really uh, barbaric uh, crime of uh, forced organ harvesting uh, has now been, been really um, uh, revealed by the independent China Tribunal um, in 2019, chaired by Sir Geoffrey Nice, QC, the British barrister who prosecuted Slobodan Milosevic, and incidentally, he's now chairing a tribunal uh, on the uh, Uyghur genocide, 
Um, but the China Tribunal concluded that uh, there was uh, evidence beyond reasonable doubt that forced organ harvesting, uh, primarily, although not exclusively, from Falun Gong practitioners, uh, is uh, happening on a widespread scale, that it does amount to a crime against humanity. And the conclusion of the China Tribunal's judgment is very damning. Uh, they conclude, uh, and what's important to remember about that judgment is that the panel were not um, uh, people with a long history of speaking out on human rights in China. They were, they were a truly independent body in the sense that uh, they had no human rights agenda uh, on China. Um, they were a mixture of lawyers, uh, medical experts, uh, an academic and a, a business person. And they concluded unanimously that uh, these crimes against humanity mean that anyone interacting with the Chinese Communist Party regime should do so, in their words, uh, knowing that they are interacting with a criminal state. Let me turn uh, briefly to the situation for Christians, because again, Christians uh, are facing the worst persecution since uh, the Cultural Revolution. The, the Chinese Communist Party uh, ever since uh, it took power, has uh, always been hostile to religion. And I think it's gone through several uh, different periods. It went through a period where it tried to, to drive religion as a whole, and, and Christianity in particular, uh, uh, out to, to eliminate it. When it realized uh, that that failed, and they only succeeded in driving it Christianity underground, uh, their policy reverted to uh, a policy of, of control. Um, and I think what we're now seeing is a real intensification of uh, control, but also coercion. So we've seen the destruction of thousands of crosses and churches, uh, including even the dynamiting of uh, some churches. Uh, in the state-controlled churches, which are uh, highly restricted, uh, we've seen uh, churches forced to display images of Xi Jinping or or Chinese Communist Party propaganda banners alongside, or even in some cases, instead of uh, religious uh, imagery uh, in those churches. Um, people under the age of 18 are now forbidden uh, from going to places of worship. Uh, and a large number of uh, clergy, both Protestant and Catholic, uh, have been imprisoned. Um, uh, Pastor Wang Yi, for example, of the early rain church in Chengdu, was sentenced to nine years in prison just after Christmas 2019. And the Chinese Communist Party is now talking about producing its own new translation uh, of the Bible, um, a translation that it says will uh, be the Bible with um, uh, Chinese uh, communist characteristics. Uh, and we've already seen some indicators of the reinterpretation of stories in the Bible uh, in, a, in a way that is totally unrecognizable to uh, anyone who, who reads uh, the, the Bible itself and, uh, and that puts it in uh, CCB uh, propaganda narrative. It's also important when we think about Christians not just to focus on um, freedom of religion or freedom of worship uh, as such, but also to remember uh, the massive crackdown on human rights defenders um, many of whom uh, either are Christians motivated by their faith uh, or uh, are uh, people who have been defending Christians and other religious minorities and freedom of religion uh, uh, across the board. So particularly the uh, arrest, imprisonment, dis disbarring or even disappearance of hundreds of lawyers uh, over recent years. And I think particularly of, of Gao Zhisheng, who is still... Uh, missing uh, China's best-known human rights lawyer, but hundreds of other human rights lawyers as well um, uh, disappeared or disbarred or jailed for defending religious freedom cases. Let me turn very finally but briefly to the situation in Hong Kong with regard to religious freedom, because over the last uh, couple of years, and especially since July last year with the introduction of the draconian national security law, uh, Hong Kong's freedoms uh, have been torn up. Uh, Hong Kong's uh, uh, autonomy has been uh, destroyed in flagrant breach of the uh, Sino-British uh, uh, Joint um, uh, Agreement, uh, an international treaty. Uh, but we are already seeing the impact of that on freedom of religion 
in Hong Kong. Uh, we've seen the police uh, raid uh, the Good Neighbor North District Church, which was a church where, where the pastor had been very involved in, in providing pastoral support to the protesters in 2019. Uh, HSBC froze the church's bank account and the pastor's bank account. We've also seen the Catholic Diocese of Hong Kong um, uh, discourage or, in effect, even ban uh, a a planned uh, prayer campaign by uh, lay Catholics who wanted to have a public campaign to pray for Hong Kong last year. And the diocese itself, presumably under pressure from the authorities, uh, discouraged that. Uh, and the diocese issued instructions to clergy in Hong Kong uh, to be careful in their sermons. Um, the actual words of Cardinal John Tong in his uh, letter to Catholic priests uh, were, watch your words. And that's a very chilling message uh, for uh, a place like Hong Kong, where religious freedom has until recently uh, been intact. Let me just uh, close by saying um, last, last year, uh, CSW, one of the organizations that I'm still affiliated with and used to work for full time, published a, a report uh, on all of these issues called Repressed, Removed and Reeducated, the Stranglehold on Religious Life in China. And at the beginning of the report, we quote two people uh, whose words are very similar to each other, but I think sum up the situation in China today. The first was Pastor Wang Yi uh, of the Early Rain Church, uh, who said this, this country is launching a war against the soul in Xinjiang, in Tibet, in Shanghai, in Beijing, in Chengdu. The rulers of this country are launching this war. But they have established for themselves an enemy that can never be detained, can never be destroyed, will never capitulate nor be conquered, the soul of man. And then in remarkably similar words, the former United States ambassador for international religious freedom, uh, Sam Brownback, who just left, left office at the start of this year, he said these words, it seems that the Chinese government is at war with faith but it is a war they will not win. The Chinese Communist Party must hear the cry of its people for religious freedom. So it's uh, a privilege to have this opportunity to outline these issues. In terms of what we're doing here in the UK, I'm happy to address that in the Q&A if it comes up. Um, one of the bodies that I'm involved with, the Conservative Party Human Rights Commission, published a major report in January this year called The Darkness Deepens. That's a report on human rights in China uh, across the board, but it has a very strong section on uh, violations of freedom of religion or belief. And I believe that uh, we as a country should be completely reevaluating uh, our relationship with, not with the people of China or the country of China, but with the Chinese regime uh, that is uh, trampling on human rights generally and on freedom of religion or belief in particular uh, across the board. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben, for that uh, broad and also telling detail in uh, in that uh, that broad overview of what's what's happening. I'd like to to ask you too. You you make the very good distinction there between uh, the the people of China, of course, and the uh, the Communist Party, and uh, also brought in the, the what is happening in Hong Kong. It seems as though what has happened in Hong Kong, the protests, the bringing in of the security law, only underline and strengthen Xi, De Xi Jinping's efforts to pathologize um, ethnic uh, diversity and, and dissent in uh, an even harsher phase than we've seen before of coercive assimilation. I'd like to ask you, we were talking about um, responses of international governments and uh, there have been some sanctions of several Chinese Communist Party officials for policies on Xinjiang that we've seen recently in March uh, through the EU and through the UK. I wonder if you can speak briefly about those, those sanctions and if you feel that there's a certain momentum building around that, that track of advocacy. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, those sanctions were very welcome. They were um, 
long overdue. There have been uh, growing uh, calls for such sanctions in, in Parliament uh, in this country and indeed in the EU and, and other countries for some time. Um, but uh, they're certainly welcome. Of course, they were met uh, almost immediately by retaliatory uh, sanctions by the Chinese Communist Party against a number of British members of Parliament, and the Conservative Party Human Rights Commission was also on the uh, on the Chinese uh, sanctions list. Um, I think the only thing I would say is it's a very welcome start, but um, it's not enough, uh, uh, and the, we need uh, more. So um, in regard to Xinjiang, I think it's very surprising that the party secretary in Xinjiang, uh, um, Chen Chuanguo, who of course was previously the party secretary in Tibet, and uh, you, one can see the parallels of his approach in Tibet and his approach uh, to the Uyghurs, that he's not on the sanctions list uh, yet, which is um, astonishing given that he's really the architect uh, of, of uh, the genocide of the Uyghurs. So the first thing is to, to have him on the sanctions list. And then I think that the next step is to uh, apply more sanctions, both for officials responsible for the genocide of the Uyghurs, but also for those responsible for the repression in Tibet uh, uh, and those responsible for dismantling Hong Kong's uh, freedoms in flagrant breach of uh, an international treaty. Um, so uh, so we, need, we need more such measures. And I think um, the last thing I'd say is that I, I think it's really important that the free world um, act uh, as much as possible in coordination and in, in concert together um, which, of course, they did in, in applying um, the sanctions in relation to Xinjiang. Uh, uh, and I hope we can see more of that uh, concerted, uh, coordinated action by uh, the UK, the EU, Canada, the United States and, and, and others. Yes, it was disappointing that Chen Guanguo wasn't on that uh, list. He was sanctioned earlier, of course, by the US Treasury, but uh, the fact that he didn't appear on the list um, was was um, an odd omission in many ways, given, as you say, he, he was party secretary of Tibet before being transferred to Xinjiang in 2016, and he uh, presided over a much more systematic approach to securitization and um, assimilation of, uh, of distinctive ethnic identities to the, to the stage that we're seeing today. And just to, we still have um, Dr. Dorji with us, and I wanted to, to also mention, to go back to the anniversary of the Panchen Lama's uh, disappearance and abduction, it, it seems as though uh, that moment when uh, the, the young boy and his family were taken away apparently by charter jet previously only used for uh, members of the Politburo into hiding that um, all those years ago in 1995. It seems that that marked perhaps the first step in uh, Beijing's uh, efforts to seriously control the Tibetan Buddhist institutions and reincarnation, and they're seeking to create an environment in which, um, as the Dalai Lama ages, of course, they have full control over the whole succession process. But not only that, they're also seeking to influence and mold an entire younger generation of uh, tulkus, of uh, incarnate lamas through um, a very advanced system of uh, having a database of officially accepted reincarnate lamas, uh, training schools where Tulkus received training by the Communist Party state. And I just wanted to ask you, Dr. Tenzin Dorji La, what you think in terms of um, future responses uh, in the United States based on what has already been achieved. Um, to to this very vital issue of the Panchen Lama and Chinese efforts to to oversee and control all of the uh, the, the reincarnation the succession issue. Uh, hello, can you hear me? I can. We can. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kate, for um, that question. Um, of course, uh, it is a tragic. And very sad uh, that uh, his holiness, uh, Benjamin Kinjin Chitinima, you know, even didn't have a childhood. 
who couldn't celebrate even one birthday properly. And uh, so he has forcefully disappeared uh, for 26 years. And we still don't know, honestly, uh, in, uh, how he's doing. Uh, when the international uh, you know, bodies pressured them and China repeated the same mantra uh, that he's fine and he doesn't want to be disturbed by uh, you know, all of us, uh, uh, which is just total lame excuse, as we can see. But the larger issue is, as you know, I mentioned in my presentation, you rightly highlighted it, is, uh, I mean, more than the Penchen Lama Kintin Shri Yima, uh, reincarnation system is unique to Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah? And uh, Penchen Lama uh, is the second highest uh, spiritual figure in Tibetan Buddhism. And oftentimes, uh, Penchen Lama reincarnations and the Dalai Lama reincarnations, uh, they become you know, teacher and disciples of each other, and many of them have recognized each other's reincarnations. And so China knows that, uh, you know, system very well. And uh, so they wanted to change that completely in their political favor. And uh, so they abducted the real Penchen Lama recognized by his own Dalai Lama and installed their own version of the Penchen Yalzin Norbu. Uh, and I understand his difficulty there as a person I empathize with him. He's also another Tibetan <laughs> uh, person there. Uh, and so they hope uh, that, uh, you know, the Tibet issue will die out uh, when His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama is no more. Uh, they can use their Penchen Lama to, you know, recognize the next Dalai Lama just like they did this time with the Penchen Lama. And then they think they have completely resolved the Tibet issue. But I say, just wait a minute. It doesn't work easily that way. And of course, China has uh, just, I think uh, Ben has really rightly pointed out, uh, you know, how they really messed up, uh, you know, with the most serious matters like rewriting the whole Bible or like, uh, you know, uh, politicizing the whole religious text, you know, in the case of Tibetan Buddhism, sinusizing it completely uh, with the socialist values and characteristics, you know, that's their mantra. Uh, and um, so they have also designed laws, as you said, you know, to recognize the lamas. And uh, so they have, I think, a few hundred uh, reincarnated Tibetan lamas on their list. And uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is not on this list. His Holiness Benjamin Gendin Chui Yima is not on this list. The mostly, two most important uh, religious figures. And so through that kind of institutional manipulation control, uh, they wanted to completely, I think, uproot the Tibetan Buddhist faith. Uh, uh, because uh, China is a communist country, an atheist uh, you know, body, and they really don't believe in any kind of religious faith system. So that's why they are ruthless with all religious belief systems uh, there, as Ben has given a very uh, broad view of that. I totally uh, you know, agree with that. So United States of America, especially in the Tibet uh, Policy and Support Act, has made few significant changes. And the number, another one is that you know, the China cannot meddle with uh, you know, recognizing His Holiness next reincarnation. Yeah, and that's a huge. And we would like the international community to come up with the same uh, kind of act, if you will, and the uh, European Parliament, uh, it would be wonderful. Uh, and uh, because uh, in, the, in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, uh, you know, uh, these two reincarnations are, have done so much uh, for the preservation of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, and uh, although they try to control the Penchen Lama now, uh, they cannot control the next Dalai Lama. I have said it with all the proud, he saw that the Dalai Lama, when the time comes, you know, he said, I was his translator oftentimes before he said, you know, he would like the China Tibet uh, issues to be resolved uh, through dialogue and middle way approaches. If that happens, he would love to return back to Tibet, right? So that we have a genuine Tibetan autonomy within the Federation of China. And we, we represented the memorandum, but China is not, doesn't have political will to respond to that. And they uh, think they have all the answers now. But he's always said, if the Tibet case doesn't resolve, he is not going to be reborn under the Chinese control. So he will be in a free country. Uh, so, uh, you know, I just want, I have made this point many times before, and I want to say it one more time, China cannot dream to control the next Dalai Lama. And the U.S. should implement, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you, know the, uh, you know, things they have, uh, you know, put in the Tibet policy and support that. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Thank you. Uh, I think one last thing I want to say is that uh, the Biden administration should, as soon as possible, appoint special coordinator for Tibet because that you know position plays a significant role uh, in in terms of uh, voicing for uh, you know all these issues, religious freedom in you know Tibet and the reincarnation of Tibet. Uh, as Ben mentioned, uh, or I think one of you mentioned about uh, the former ambassador for uh, the international religious freedom of uh, the Trump administration, uh, Sam Brownberg, with whom I met a few times, and he traveled all the way to India, Dharamsala, to meet with his holiness and to raise this issue about his reincarnation. And he wanted to make it internationalized so that you know the whole international is behind this, uh, you know, together. Mm. Thank you for that, Dr. Dorji. You're welcome. So I, I'd just like to pick up on something that uh, Ben had mentioned, which is that um, there is a Uyghur tribunal that's uh, going to be held soon. I think the, uh, the forced organ harvesting tribunal that was held in London under the same auspices was uh, a very effective means of um, holding to account, prevent, presenting uh, strong evidence on, on this important issue. And I fully expect the Uyghur Tribunal will, will also break new ground in terms of presenting evidence and, uh, and a momentum towards a challenge of those policies. And uh, as, as Ben had, had mentioned, the Chinese government um, certainly align Tibet and Xinjiang um, and any ethnic diversity and expressions of religious, cultural, national identity are viewed as threats to security with the, with the, um, with the impact that we, we see the same uh, similar extreme policies. The Chinese government does adapt a different approach a different strategy in Tibet and Uyghur areas. In Tibet, there aren't the same extent of forced labor camps, nor are there the same supply chain networks that uh, that we see in, in Xinjiang with, with people being sent to, to labor right across the PRC. It doesn't happen in quite the same way. But the threats to the evisceration of uh, identity um, are real and uh, the the very systematic impacts of the leadership on uh, on Tibetan identity, cultural, religious civilization are very are ever present. So I'd like to hand back, I think we're out of time um, unless Sering, you have questions that have come through at all. Uh, no questions from me. Okay, so I think in that case that um, that we are out of time, um, and I'd just like to again thank Sering for convening the panel. I'm sorry about the technical glitches at the beginning, um, and to our eminent speakers for Jim who had to depart for um, another other meetings in Westminster, and Dr. Tenzin Dorji La and Ben, and thank you both very much for your, your strong, passionate commitment to this, this issue, which very much appreciated. And, and thank you, Kate, amazing for your, uh, uh, thank you very much for your amazing uh, sharing this uh, very important uh, subject that has been going on for so long under the Chinese communist rule. I think uh, Ben Roger has been amazing, I know, for uh, I think since 2017, that's how I connected with you, uh, how he sort of set up the Hong Kong Watch, how he sort of really mobilized not only NGOs and individuals and Chinese students, but highest level in the British establishment. I think this is a very, very admirable work. And I have, uh, I, I admire you and I look up to you and uh, I would like to learn and to seek your advice uh, as we go along, uh, you know, struggling for our mutuals or shared interest to bring about just, you know, a good human rights for all people, especially those are being persecuted by the Chinese regime. So, uh, Ben, as always, uh, I value your time and thank you very much. And I want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Tins Dojela um, uh, for uh, attending this uh, 
a special webinar and you are very well placed uh, Tibetan speaker with uh, amazing records and uh, a long service uh, as well and with your uh, commissionership uh, in the U.S., you know, it uh, was a commission on international religious, um, I, I believe it's, 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 it's amazing. So thank you very much for your valuable time. And I know it's very early uh, where you are. And G uh, Jim Shannon for your amazing solidarity and strong words. And we would love to work with you uh, on Uyghurs issues, Tibetan issues, you know, all others, you know, Christians and so on, uh, you know, beliefs and uh, rights of minorities in, in um, China, under Chinese rule. I think we cannot uh, conclude this session without um, <clears throat> quoting this Article 36 of the Chinese uh, constitution, which guarantees citizens of the People's Republic of China enjoy freedom of religious belief. I know we all talked about it, but I just want to state, uh, state this, uh, was a quote this from the constitution. No state organ, public organization or individual may compel citizens to believe in or not to believe in any religion, nor may they discriminate against citizens who believe in or do not believe in any religion. Now, however, in the note of the Memorandum of Jinan Autonomy for the Tibetan people, which is a follow-up clarification note, a uh, written note submitted by the envoys of the Dalai Lama to the Chinese representative during their, uh, after the eighth round of talks in 2008, it stated this, I quote, the spiritual relationship between master and student and the giving of religious teachings, etc., are essential components of the Dharma practice. Restricting these, restricting these is a violation of re religious freedom. Similarly, the interference and direct involvement by the state and its institutions in matters of recognition of reincarnated lamas as provided in the regulation on management of reincarnated lamas adopted by the state on July 18th, 2007, uh, 2007 is a grave violation of freedom of religious belief enshrined in the Chinese constitution. Code close. I think it sums up there is a violation of religious belief in China. We at Global Alliance for Tibet and Persecuted Minorities will continue our voice and raise awareness and campaign for the rights of the people under Chinese rule. So that's all I want to say. And uh, thank you once again very much. I know we have another technical glitch with Kate. I think we are being watched constant, constantly, especially I think you, Kate. <laughs> so thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you very very much. much. Bye. Thank you. thank you to our viewers. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.